Now the task which I have before me is virtually impossible. There was a time when world perspectives could be dealt with quite simply. You'd be dealing with events in one country or another country. Not anymore. Wherever you look in the world, whichever continent, whichever country, you see the same turbulence, the same uh, profound crisis at all levels. Economics, which is always the basis, of course, ultimately. Economic crisis, financial crisis, social crisis, political crisis. A crisis of confidence of the ruling class. And that, of course, represents something. It means something. History is not uh, a meaningless uh, assortment of, uh, of events as the so-called postmodernists would have us to believe. No, history has a meaning. And in the last analysis, it is true. Marx and Engels, by the way, never said what is attributed to, it, to, to them by uh, the fools in the universities. They never said that, they never reduced everything to economics. You've heard that, uh, that ridiculous argument. Reduce everything to, how the hell can you reduce everything to economics? No, what Marx did say, however, and this is an elementary truth which does not brook contradiction, is the following. That in the last analysis, in the last analysis, the viability of any socio-economic system is determined by its, by its capacity, its ability to develop the means of production. Yes, 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 a thousand times yes. As long as capitalism was delivering the goods, as, as the Americans put it, as long as there was uh, economic progress and uh, living standards were increasing, and the, the situation of the workers was increasing, then it was, well, things were not too bad. Things, people did not question the existing system. They took it for granted. It's something that always has existed, always will exist, and so on. Yes, now there's a change. And that, by the way, affects the mass organizations of the working class, and reformism in particular. The crisis of capitalism is at the same time as night follows day, the crisis of reformism. After 1945, we had a long period, decades, of an upswing, an unprecedented upswing in the productive forces in America, Europe, Japan, and so on. Of course, it wasn't the same, it wasn't the same for, for the majority of the human race living in the so-called third world, but even, even they progressed to some extent. But in the advanced capitalist countries, it was like boom time. And, and there was the classical period of reforms, of reformism. The Labour Party in Britain, the Social Democracy in uh, in Europe, gave reforms, important reforms, like the national health and things of this, free education, things, things of this uh, character. Important reforms. Now, reformism with reforms makes sense. To any, any work, it makes sense. Reformism without reforms, reformism with counter-reforms, makes no sense whatsoever to anybody. And thereby, we see the reasons for the crisis of reformism, which you see in every single country. I'll perhaps deal with some of the examples if I have time in the course of my, of my lead-off. But yes, the decisive turning point, there are, you know there are decisive turning points in history. It is not an accident they refer to, historians refer to, before and after 1789, the French Revolution. Or 1917, the Russian Revolution. Okay? Or the fall of the Soviet Union, you could say was a, a, a decisive turning point, yes. But 2008 was undoubtedly the most important uh, turning point in modern history because it marked the end of this long period of ups and Of course, there were ups and downs. You must be careful. The capitalist system has uh, basic laws, and the laws are booms and slumps. It always moves in booms and slumps. It always has. It always will from the moment it was born to the moment that when it's overthrown but the working class. You always get uh, ve uh, different uh, ups and downs. Yes, but we're not talking about a, a slight down in 2008. We're talking about a fundamental organic crisis of the system. And that organic crisis, my friends, continues to exist today. Despite everything you read, you shouldn't believe everything you read, by the way, whether it's the economic forecast or the behavior of the Russian secret services in uh, 
in the, whatever it was. You know, don't, don't believe everything that you read. But this, you get constant for the last 10 years. It's, been, it's an anniversary, of course, now, isn't it? 2018, if my maths serves my memory correctly. It's 10 years, isn't it? 10 years since this uh, slump. And they're still struggling to get out of it. And I would, say, I would add, struggling in vain, struggling desperately to get out of this crisis. Ten years of cuts of austerity where the ruling class placed all the burdens of this crisis on the shoulders of the working class. It is quite monstrous if you think about it. They don't think about it. They don't talk about it. Let's talk about it then. You know, why are there cuts? Why is there austerity? You know the answer. Because there's a deficit, my friends. Because we must tackle the deficit. They all agree on this. The Tories, the Liberals, the right-wing Labourites. So this deficit must deal with the deficit. What they never ask is, why is there a deficit? And the reason is quite as plain as the nose on your face. In 2008, when the whole damned uh, uh, private financial system collapsed like a, a house of cards, what did the bourgeois do? According to the economic theory, you see, the state should play no role in, in the economy. You've heard of that, have you? The ones that are studying economics. Any economic students here? Put your hand up. One. One brave fellow admits to it. Congratulations. Yes, no, all, the, all the others are ashamed to put their hands up, you see. Uh, the, you know then, there's one person, I know, in the tax before they say, the state must play no role. It's the market economy, my friend. The market the economy, the market, the market, the market will solve, solve everything. Yes, well, what about 2008? When the banks collapsed after making fabulous profits but they, for a long period of time, what did they do? Did they say, oh no, state mustn't intervene. Market will solve everything. Wait, wait and see. Did they like hell? They came running with their hands out demanding cash. In America, in Britain, in Germany, in France, in Spain, everywhere. And by God, the governments gave them cash. Shoveled cash. I'm not talking about small amounts here. You know, George W. Bush, he was supposed to, a Republican, supposed to be in favor of a balanced budget. And a strong dollar. It comes with an open checkbook. How much do you want, guys? Billion? Take a billion. Two billion? Ten billion? Take ten billion. Take a trillion. Take what you want. And by God, they took it. They took it and they put it in their pocket and that's the last you heard of it. No recovery of the economy. No productive investment. Despite cheap credit, all the stimulus, stimulants which they try to give to desperately revive the private market economy. The state. The state, my friends. Without which the, that whole damn thing would have collapsed ten years ago. Actual fact doesn't admit any argument whatsoever. And since that time, all they've achieved, what have they achieved in the last ten years? All that they've achieved in, uh, uh, on the basis of putting all the, the, the burden of this deficit on the shoulders of the poorest sections of society, the workers, the youth, the unemployed, the uh, sick people, and so on and so forth, all that they've achieved is to transform what was a gigantic black hole in the private banking sector into a gigantic black hole in the public finances. That's all. And who pays? Well, you know who pays. Now, if you say A, you must say B, C, and D. The, the, ten years of austerity, and for ten years they've been singing the same song, the green shoots, the green shoots, we're recovering, we're recovering. Well, I don't see any uh, particular sign of, of, of a recovery. There's been a, a minor upturn in the economy, in, not, not in Europe, but in Germany fundamentally. Greece, there's no upturn. Italy, there's no upturn. France is in, in a very bad way. And Britain, well, you know the position. So therefore, it's, it's some, in America, there's been a certain, allegedly a certain uh, upturn. That's, that's, the extent of it is debatable. But such of an upturn that exists is based on what? It's based on, on the continuation of the policy, which they've done for some years now, of cheap credit. The state, dare I say it, the state again, the, it, through the central banks, gives uh, cheap credit, zero interest. Sometimes even less than zero. I can't quite get my head around that, but there you are. Zero interest to the banks in the hope that they're going to invest. In productive activity, the banks do not invest and will not invest in productive uh, activity. 
for, for obvious reasons. Why invest in new plant and new machinery when you can't sell the goods that you've already got accumulated, e.g. steel, where there's a huge overproduction on a global scale, as Mr. Trump will soon point out. And therefore, what's the point of... of, of well, this, this crisis of overproduction, there's no argument about that. It is, a, at bottom, a crisis of overproduction. And therefore, if markets are saturated, they can't produce. China, for example, was undoubtedly one of the main elements in the, motor, the, the global motor force for the last uh, few decades, as a matter of fact. But look, it's not rocket science. Just work it out. If Europe and America are not consuming, because they can't consume because the low level, because, by the way, the workers' wages have been kept low in all countries, while profits have boomed colossally. I'll, if I've got the time, I'll, I'll give you some of the figures later on. Wages are held up. Living standards are held up. There's causal debts, including consumer debts. People have overspent. They owe a lot of money from, from the credit cards and so on. If Europe and America are not consuming, China cannot produce. Because China, the Chinese economy, depends on exports. They can't absorb all, all the massive amounts which the Chinese economy is producing. They can't absorb it. They must export. They used to export to Europe and other countries. They can't. And if China is not able to produce, Argentina, Brazil, Australia, and other countries cannot export their raw materials. That's the, in, in a few words, in a few, a few uh, sentences, the basis of the present crisis that exists. They're trying desperately to... to, to what, they, what, they, what, are, what are they trying to do? By continuing this policy of cheap credit, which, by the way, from, from, from the standpoint of, of, of orthodox economics, I appeal to my friend at the back, who is a great expert on this subject, I hope. I'm going to pass your exams, are you? You will after this lecture. Well, perhaps you won't after this lecture. I can't, I can't guarantee the results. But, uh, you know, uh, what, is, what was I going to say? Yes, uh, cheap, cheap credit. They're trying to, 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 to get the people to invest... By, issue, by continuing cheap credit. Now, you see, Alan Greenspan, you've heard of him. Alan Greenspan, who used to be the president of the uh, Fed, the American Fed, Federal Reserve, uh, more than 10 years ago, before the, before the crunch, said the following. The purpose of the central banks is to be like a, a, like a, a wet blanket in a party, you know, like the party we're going to have after this, I hope. And uh, when they see people getting too drunk, the, the punch bowl is passing around. This is cheap credit. The punch bowl has been... Everyone is happy. Everyone is getting drunk. When the party is getting a bit out of hand, the purpose of the central bank is to remove the punch bowl before things get ugly, before things de degenerate into a fight. I was amused to see the other day, and this shows the real situation, an American economist saying, oh, no, 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 no. The present position is the task of the central banks is to keep the, the, the punch bowl circulating happily until the investment arrives. Now then, that's an interesting scenario. Because the investment, the productive investment, is not arriving, or not arriving in any kind of quantities which would make things safe. I mentioned China. And by the way, all this expansion of, of credit, it, it means what? It means they're trying to reflate the bubble that, they, that burst in 2008. Okay? Now, if you reflate a bubble... Sooner or later, you find, you must have known this as a child, you must have played with bubbles, soap bubbles, as I did. So they get to a certain size, they tend to burst with unfortunate consequences. In other words, they, 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 as, as for learning, they always say, we've learned from history, we've learned from history. They've learned nothing. Because they're doing the same, exactly the same mistakes that Greenpan, Greenspan did in the past. The enormous extension of state uh, funds and so on, quantitative easing, it's called, that's the punch bowl, by the way, uh, can only lead to one thing. We pointed this out a thousand times, despite what Keynes wrote, and he wrote a lot of rubbish. D uh, the, that uh, the expansion of, of credit and uh, state funding and exp monetary expenditure and so on inevitably leads to inflation. There's no, no argument about it. It inevitably will lead to an explosion of in inflation at a, cer at a certain stage. That's quite a dangerous thing to do. It means debt. The state, this argument, oh, the state will pay, the state will find money, the state will pay for this, the state will pay for that. My dear, it's Keynes' argument, you know. My dear friends, I've got information for you. 
The state does not have any money. The state hasn't got a bean other than what it can extract from taxes and so on. That's all. All right? So, so this is a false argument. And therefore, that leads to, in itself leads to a colossal increase in the deficit, an increase in debt as night follows day. And that's just what's happened. Instead of, with all the sacrifice and the austerity and the cuts and the suffering and the deaths and the misery that's been caused for the last 10 years, they have not solved the central problem. The debt continues to increase. By the way, not just in the West. I've got some astonishing figures. I've got many figures I will not bore you with, with them because it makes things too long. But I can't resist this. China, get a hold of this. China, in 2007, had a, 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 a accumulated debt of $6 trillion. Quite a lot of money, I hear you say. Not so. 2017, that's last year, China had accumulated debts of $27 trillion. And this cannot continue. So there's this overhang of debt, this, like a black cloud, overhang of debt over the whole system. And let's be clear about this. It's very fragile. The whole world economy is in a fragile state, despite what they say. Any shock could be an economic shock, stock market, a serious shock market, uh, shock, uh, shocks and scares, you know. A stock market crisis, or even a non uh, a non uh, uh, economic uh, shock, such as war in the Middle East, or which drives the, the price of oil up, whatever, any, anything like that, can cause a severe slump. And therefore, if you know these facts, then you will not be surprised that the last few days, you've seen uh, and few weeks and few months, these gyrations on the stock exchange. It's like a madhouse. Stock exchange is like a casino. Except a, fr a friend of mine once said, well, yes, it's like a casino. It's like a betting shop where all the horses win until all the horses lose. That's the stock exchange. It's, 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 just imagine the, the lunacy of a system where the entire world economy is dependent on a gigantic casino. That's the state of affairs that exists. But more interesting from our point of view is what this shows about the psychology of the ruling class. And this instability, this constant instability, this is quite serious, these gyrations, that are, the uncontrolled swings that are taking place, ups and downs and so on, quite jolts. What do they reflect? They reflect a, an extreme nervousness on the part of, of the bourgeois. That's what it reflects. Extreme nervousness about the economic out, outlook and, and the social outlook and the political outlook. You better believe it. These guys are extremely nervous they have no confidence whatsoever in the future of their own system. I think the only people that do have confidence is the reformists, who is the blindest of the blind. Now, into, the, into this mess, into this colossally unstable, very delicate equation, steps, guess who? Donald J. Trump, with his size 15 boots, army boots, steps in. With his policy of America first. America first, which means, by the way, everyone else last. Make America great again, he says, and he means it. And he means make America great at the expense of the rest of the world. That's the facts of the case. I was quite amused. I was in Pakistan, actually, in January when he turned up in, uh, in Davos. They, they had this CNN, this wretched channel, which carries all this rubbish on it. But I followed uh, Trump's speech and I noticed he said he wasn't going to go to Davos. The Davos, that's, that's the devil, that's Satan uh, in Canada, that's uh, the world uh, establishment, the global establishment. He turned up with very soothing words, which I noticed his, his audience were not clapping very much. Some of them actually booed at, at some stages, you know, it's, it's astonishing. President of the United States get booed in a place like Davos. He informed them, which they should have been pleased to hear the news, that he was a great admirer, a champion of free trade. Hooray! Free trade. But, he said, but, he said, free trade, hooray! But, he said, it must be fair. Oh! What does this mean? It must be fair. It must be fair to the United States. And, by the way, the same time he made this speech in favor of free trade, he introduced punitive tariffs against a minor thing, solar solar panels and uh, washing machines. Incidentally, the reason that the Yanks give for this protectionism, it is protectionism, 
Is this in defense of their national security interests? I ask myself, washing machines? <laughs> What's the mean? Of course, they can't wash the uh, under, underpants of the American army. I don't know. It's, it's uh, astonishing. They introduced, yes, quite swinging tariffs. I think it was, yes, 50% against solar panels. That's mainly directed against China, by the way. And uh, 50% against washing machines. There we are. That will teach them. Washing machines. But mind you, it, let's be clear. Washing machines and solar panels are not great in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the great uh, panorama of world trade. They don't account for very much. So you could afford to shrug that off. But now... And that was the worry at the time. They said, oh, no, no, this is a dangerous precedent. This is very slippery ground. What does he do now? He's just announced, they haven't yet implemented it, but I think they will, despite the howls of protest, tariffs on, 25% tariff on steel and a 10% tariff on aluminium. Now, that's serious stuff. That is serious stuff. And it's of course, howls of protest, of course. From the Europeans, from the Canadians, they say they're going to be temporarily exempt. We'll see how, how long that will last. Oh, Britain, Britain is asked to be, of course, of the, because of the special relationship, they're asking to be ex exempted also. Uh, let's see. I'd be interested to see what happens about that special relationship. More seriously still, you probably haven't noticed this, unless you go on holidays to the States, the American dollar has been falling recently. It, it rose quite a, quite a long way. It's fallen back quite a long way since. And the Secretary of the, of the Treasury, what's the mention, I think? Whatever his name is. Stephen Minchin, that's it, Secretary of the Treasury, made a speech, an irresponsible speech, saying, yeah, it's good. It's good that the dollar should fall because it helps our exports, which it does. It means the American exports are cheaper and the imports from, from Europe and Canada and China are more expensive. This is a finished recipe, if it's not uh, stopped, for trade war. Because the others have already said, we intend to retaliate. The, American, the Europeans have said, we're going to retaliate against American jeans and I know, bubble gum or whatever else they, they picked, uh, hamburgers, no, American products. And Trump immediately said, oh yeah, you're going to do that? I'm going to retaliate against European cars. That's how a trade war starts. Now, perhaps the, trade, the idea of a trade war perhaps seems to, be, to you to be a little bit uh, abstract. It isn't. It isn't. It's an absolutely fundamental question because ever since the Second World War, one of the main motor forces that propelled the capitalist system forward was precisely the colossal expansion of world trade, particularly in the last period with so-called globalization. It did have an effect. You see, let's, as Marxists, let's, let's explain the, the facts of life. What are the two major obstacles in the way of human progress at the present time in the world? I answer. On the one hand, private ownership of the means of production for profit. Secondly, the nation state. These are barriers which hold up the development of, uh, of the productive forces. But by means of expanding world trade, reducing tariffs, and so on and so forth, they partially, for, for temporary people, they got around this question of the limitation of the national state. Now, of course... <laughs> Trump comes along, not only Trump, because all, they'll all be at it, and say, no, 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 we are in favor of protectionism. He actually said the other day, I think Rob pointed this out to me, protectionism, protectionism is a good thing. Did he say that, Rob? Or sir? Protectionism is a good thing. He said, this, is, this is completely irresponsible. <laughs> protectionism. Let us define, protectionism is the export of unemployment. Think about it. You export your unemployment. Trump is complaining because the steel industry in the States has been devastated. That's perfectly true. Partly because of cheap uh, imports from China and other countries. That's also true. His solution is quite simple. Keep out these products. We'll have a nice steel industry. Yes, but that's got consequences. What he's doing is exporting unemployment then to China. We'll have to close steel factories and so on. This is serious stuff. There's one little fact which people are generally not aware of. What turned the 1929 Wall Street crash into the Great Depression, which lasted 10 years or so up to the Second World War, was precisely the introduction of protectionism and competitive devaluations. Beggar my neighbor, that uh, strategy. And that, of course, had severe social and political consequences. Now, 
I jumped from that. There's many, I don't want to spend too much time on the economy. We've discussed this many times in the past. We don't have to change anything in our fundamental analysis. But there, there's a, an element which I've mentioned. The last 10 years has been seen the most staggering increase. I think it's unprecedented in history. In inequality. It's obscene. I mean, uh, you've heard the, fa the fascia being stated. Man. Just let me do a couple of facts. I can't resist this. The three richest men in uh, America, in the United States, which are who? Who are they? I've lost their names now. Anyway, the three richest uh, billionaires, Bill Gates is one of them. Is that, uh, Warren, uh, what's the, what's the, uh, Warren Bullock, Bullock is the other one. And there's another one whose name escapes me. Jeff. Yes, that's him. That's him. I've got the, the same amount of wealth as half the American population. That's 160 million people. Three individuals have more wealth than 160 million Americans. Get, get your head around that, which is astonishing. Uh, one, uh, one uh, where are we? Yes. One CEO, executive in the USA, earns the same amount for one day's work as an average worker earns in one year. This kind of thing. It's absolutely, I've got lots of figures, but I won't uh, bore you with it. It's, it's too much. You can get these quite easily. <coughs> Let me see. Go through this. And uh, you see, the, the question is, this is known. This is This is known. This is seen. Many people ask. They see the bankers getting bonuses and so on and so forth. And I can't get a job, this kind of thing. There's a burning sense of indignation. A hatred of the rich. In the United States, you better believe it. It's part, a big part of the reason for the victory of Trump. Although he himself is a very rich man. It's a paradox. If Bernie Sanders would have been able to stand as the candidate... In the election, he would, he would have beaten Trump. There's uh, opinion polls have shown that. They had a massive support for his uh, very left-wing uh, program. Uh, he, he called for a revolution against the billionaire class. When have, when have you heard that in the United States and so on? Got mass support, mass, massive rallies and so on. When he was bumped, and the choice was with uh, Hillary Clinton, who was an agent of American big business of Wall Street. Everyone knows it's a creature of Wall Street. And Trump, who demagogically put forward that I'm in favor of the worker and the working class and this, that, and the other. By the way, it's the first time in history, in, in, in 50 years at least, that the working class was ever mentioned in American politics. Even the most left-wing politician in the system always referred to the middle class. I'm in favor of the middle class. all middle classes. Trump comes and says, no, 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 I'm in favor of the working man, the working class, the miners, and so on, steel workers. Demagogic, of course, but it struck a chord, you see. Now, this is, this is, what I'm driving at is, you see, from our point of view, as Marxists, what is important is not so much economics in and of themselves. We don't study economics to amuse ourselves, whether some people do, but uh, the so-called academic Marxists. I think that's a contradiction in terms, by the way. How can you be an academic Marxist? You're either a Marxist or you're not a Marxist. They're definitely not Marxists. You know, but we don't study economics from an abstract point. But from the point of view of how it impinges on the consciousness of the masses and the working class and the class struggle, that's what interests us. And how does this situation impinge on the consciousness of the working class? You know, some people have asked me over the last 10 years, hey, well, if the city wasn't so bad, Alan, where's the revolution? Where's the revolution? When are the workers going to move? To which I answer, do you want an answer to that question? Yes. I'll tell you. I'll, give you, I'll tell you exactly when the workers of Britain are going to move. When they are ready. Not one minute before and not one minute after, okay? But it takes time. It takes time. Consciousness is something which is molded over a period of many years, even generations, decades. Okay? The, mo the, the mentality, the psychology of an American worker, a British worker, was shaped by the past when uh, they had decent living standards and so on. And people, people always think, well, we can go back to this. We can go back to it. They cannot, of course. They can never go back to this. It's finished. You know? The Economist carried an article quite as 
perspicacious article a few years ago in which they asked the question, people, they said, well, people are asking, when will we return to normality? The economist said, well, we will return, of course. Of course we will return to normality. But it will be a new normality. And it actually quoted the question of pensions. You know, for decades, workers, people have considered that pensions is a right. That they've always existed. Pensions are not a right. They had to be fought for. They didn't always exist. You know the first man that introduced pensions? In Some of you know, you heard this before. So don't put your hand up. No, there we are. I'll surprise you. Otto von Bismarck, the reactionary iron chancellor, introduced at the end of the last century, he introduced uh, pensions for workers to, in order to stop the development of socialism and the, the social democracy. Yes, he introduced a pension for everyone above the age of 65, was it, or 70? I think it was 70, actually. The average life expectancy in Germany was 59 at that time, so it was a fairly safe bet, shall we say. But no, pensions have not always existed and will not necessarily exist in the future. They're already raising the question, oh, well, people are living too long, we can't afford this, it's an enormous burden on the finances. In Spain, that's caused a revolution. Well, something like a revolutionary movement anyway. It's astonishing. It just exploded. Why? Because people found out I didn't know myself. The Spanish government, this gangster government of the PP, the the so-called People's Party, the Spanish uh, right-wing Tories, have spent all the money, the the funds set aside for pensions on other things. Don't ask me what, but they've spent it anyway. It's gone. It isn't there. And people just have just found out about this, and now there's massive demonstrations. Not just in Madrid, in Barcelona, but all over Spain. Militant demonstrations of all people, of pensioners. Brought into struggle, yes, as as Lenin used to say, politics is concentrated economics. Well, here's a specific instance of that. But you see, all this, uh, this inequality and so on produces a colossal polarization between rich and poor, which wasn't supposed to exist according to these imbeciles in the universities. How I love them. University professors don't talk to me. I had seven years' experience of that, so I know what I'm talking about, you know. And I consider them to, the mo- to be the most ignorant and stupid people in society, frankly. Really. You know, I mean, they're they're ignorant. But above all, ignorant about life, about politics, about anything. In their narrow little academic uh, academia. (coughs) Yes, it's a colossal polar... uh, The working class is not supposed to exist. You heard that. (coughs) You know, oh, we're all middle class. No, come on. Don't give me a bellyache. I'm too old for for that. When when you've had the most colossal polarization in, in history between rich and poor. It's like in the States, it reminds me of 100 years ago, the time of, uh, what's his name, the first uh, Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt, who was an extreme right-winger, imperialist, but he was also a de- clever demagogue, who appealed, like Trump in a way, appealed to the working class. <clears throat> he referred to the ruling class as the robber barons. Not a bad title. Obscene wealth. Really obscene wealth uh, uh, at the top. And terrible grinding poverty at the bottom. You don't have to go to Pakistan to see this. You can see it on the streets of London. Homeless people and so on. People suffering terrible misery and poverty in a wealthy country. Should be a wealthy country like Britain. But we'll deal with that under the British uh, perspectives. This colossal tension developing between the classes. And this is reflected uh, in politics. Polarism between the left and right. This collapse of the center, that's what they're, they're all weeping about, that, oh, the center, the center, this means the death of the, yes, it does. It means the death of a lie, the death of an illusion. What's the center, for God's sake? Liberals, like Hillary Clinton, what a liberal, what a great person. A woman, too, just imagine. Imagine if she had won. Everything would have been hunky-dory in the States. <clears throat> if only they had a woman president, wouldn't they be? Same as Margaret Thatcher in Britain. Solved everything, didn't it? Oh, yes. Yes, it did, for some. But in any case, to go back to the... Uh, the, part, the collapse of the centre. This liberal fraud, that's what it was, was a reflection of the past. Not the present, certainly not the future. The past. 
when the capitalists were able to make concessions. They could, do, they could do so, and therefore they did so. Now they can't, so they won't, and they don't, and they will not give concessions. Can't. Not unless they threaten with overthrow. That's another uh, scenario. The centers collapsed. Now that's, the experience. that's why Hillary Clinton was defeated. Not because of the Russians. You know, the Russians, for Jesus God, for Christ's sake, you've got to be simple. You know, it's, these, that's like, a, like a, a school for, I don't know, for idiots. You know, there's, the weather's bad, it's the Russians, you know. You wake up in the morning, you get a pimple on your ass, it's the Russians, you know. The, 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 uh, the beast from the east, where did that come from? Siberia, obviously, it's the Russians, isn't it? It's Putin, Mr. Putin is, uh, is it's, it's just so childless, it just makes you, uh, well, you could make, it might as well make you laugh, because otherwise it'd make you, you weep. The centers collapsed because it's a gigantic fraud, a gigantic zero. And people realize this. Liberals. All that liberalism is, it's capitalism, the ugly face of capitalism, covered with a smiling mask. A smiling, benevolent, humanitarian mask. And that's all it is, is a mask. What Trump has done, that's why they don't like him, because they don't like him. Ruling class, he wasn't their candidate. Hillary Clinton was their candidate. They, didn't like, they don't like Trump, and they're doing the best to get rid of him. Why? He's a fierce reactionary. He's one of their own class. He wants to solve the problems of the capitalist class with his own peculiar methods, it's true. He's, he can't be controlled. That's the first thing they don't like about Trump. He's completely and absolutely uncontrollable. Rob and I had a conversation when he was elected. I said, well, Rob, the bourgeoisie have got different ways of controlling maverick politicians. You, you think they'll succeed? And uh, after a moment's silence, we both shook our heads. <laughs> and we were right. They can't control Trump. That's what they don't like. But above all, he shows the real crude, ugly face of capitalism without restriction. That's what it is. And that is causing colossal polarization in the States. Ultimately, it will cause colossal radicalization. It is doing so already. You saw the Women's March went, uh, the, the very day that he was inaugurated, the biggest march in the history of the States. And now, by the way, it's a different subject. In Spain, on the 8th of March, you saw. What did you see? Six million people on the 8th of March. And it wasn't just on women's questions, but that was undoubtedly the, uh, the catalyst, if you like, that brought together many people, pensioners and workers and so on. Six million on strike and hundreds of thousands demonstrating on the streets. 600,000 in Barcelona and a similar number in Madrid demonstrating on the 8th of March. When has it ever been seen? Not organized by the labor movement. Forget it. The trade unions did nothing. Of course, they're useless. They're useless, these bureaucrats. In effect, they're part of the system. And that goes not just for, for Spain, but other countries uh, as well. They did nothing. Even if they wanted to do something, they seemed to be organically uh, incapable of it. No, no, this was, a, 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 this was a reflection of a mood, a subterranean mood of discontent, of anger, of frustration, above all, I'd say, of frustration, which exists everywhere, my friends including Britain, everywhere. Same mood exists. And all that it requires is a catalyst, a point of reference whereby it can express itself somehow. Everyone knows that the existing system is rotten, that parties are rotten, the leaders are rotten, they're corrupt, they're useless. People know this. You don't even have to argue the case. In most, in, that wasn't, it wasn't the case in the past. In the past, people trusted the politicians, the judges... <laughs> The police, the law, the church. Look at all these scandals that have come to light. Terrible things about uh, sexual abuse of young kids, even murder in the case of the, the Roman Catholic Church in Ireland. They've dug up hundreds of, of in convents, hundreds of, uh, of unmarked graves, of poor little children starved and tortured to death by these creatures, by these monsters covered with a cloak of uh, sanctity and covered up also by the church, not just the Catholics, all churches. You know, they all had the, the boy scouts, they all had a, the schoolmaster, the, the scoutmaster, they all were, were treated with, uh, with respect and uh, almost a servile attitude. Not anymore, and that's a fundamental change. It is. It's a fundamental change to go back to America. 
The collapse of the centre, but the centre's collapsed everywhere. Literally, we see the same polarisation to the right and the left. And Mr. Trump, you know, he's the most unlikely ally that Karl Marx ever had for 150 years. He really is stirring things up. He really is stirring things up very nicely from our point of view, and I think he will continue to do so. Incidentally, something else about Trump. They didn't want him to be elected. All the press was against him. This is another argument. Oh, you can't change society because the press, the media will be against us. Yes, the media was against Trump. I think he only had one paper in favor of him, and I think that was a regional paper. It wasn't a national American paper. But he won, despite extremely hostile propaganda. They really had a hate campaign, similar to the campaign against Jeremy Corbyn. And look where that ended, by the way. The, uh, the hate campaign, the press, the media, ultimately it counts for nothing. Once the masses are aroused, it counts, my friends, absolutely for nothing. And it counted for nothing in America. It counted for nothing in America. I'm running out of time, aren't I? I need an hour, though. Eh? It counted for nothing. And that's a, a general picture. Look at the, the split. This is an amazing. This is, a, this is an unprecedented situation. The ruling class is split down the middle. Lenin said the first condition for a revolution is that the ruling class must be unable to rule as they did in the past, and they must be split. The American ruling class is split down the middle. Trump is the elected president of the United States. Is publicly at war with the intelligence services publicly. Against the FBI, against the CIA. He's just taking someone on from the CIA to take uh, Tillerson's place. But there we are. He said, well, when have you ever heard of You can't think of such a thing. Look, the secret services are supposed to be, nothing else, they're supposed to be secret. <laughs> they're not supposed to be in the public view, at least of all attacking them, the president of their own country. Isn't it? When has that ever been heard of? No, no, no. This is not just a crisis a political crisis. This is a crisis of the regime. It goes to the heart of the regime. And therefore, I think we're entitled to say, like a doctor that's analyzing symptoms, these are symptoms indicating the decomposition of the capitalist system, wherever you care to look, and the beginnings at least of a movement from below. Now, I'm, as I thought, I'd be running out of time, and I, I am. The movement from below has begun. I mentioned Spain. It began in Spain in Catalonia. Well, even before that, it began with the rise of Podemos and the collapse of the vote of the Socialist Party. Everywhere, the social democracy that have participated in cuts, that's the point. The workers can't forgive them for that. In Germany, now I see also, yes, they're going to have a... Frau Merkel will be returned as president with a grand coalition with the social uh, democrats, although many social democratic members are unhappy about it. But the German Social Democrats in the last election were punished for participating in the coalition. They got the lowest vote they ever had in history. 20%. Astonishing. It's a collapse. The Pasoy vote collapsed. The, the Pasok in, Greek, in Greece collapsed. And you see the rise of new formations like the Syriza in Greece, Podemos in Spain. Yes, and Jeremy Corbyn in Britain. But we're dealing with British perspectives separately. But it's the same process, I'm telling you. Same in Spain, like in Britain, it started, you could say, in Britain and Scotland, which wasn't really at basis a national, nationalist phenomenon. There was a national element, of course, but it was above all a, a burning desire that we are fed up with Labour. Labour's the same as Tories, aren't they, Jest? Labour's the same as Tories, all the establishment, this Westminster establishment, we're going to kick against them, and the only way to free ourselves from the Tories is to have our own independent country. That's the, that's the way people were, were thinking. And the Scots Nats, by the way, of course, had a, demagogically had a more left-wing pro program than Labour. Don't forget that. It started in Scotland. What happened in Scotland was a bit like a revolutionary movement in a way, although it was uh, uh, diverted along nationalist lines. Then you had the movement around Corbyn. The same process. One man, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, puts forward, we would say not even a particularly left room. It's left by, very left by Labour Party standards in recent years. There was a colossal response, which took all these idiots in the press and the parliamentary, but it took them by surprise. Why? Because that latent mood was already present, not just north of the border, but south of the border. Not just in England, but in Wales, Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, wherever you get. Look, the states also. 
the same phenomenon. And in Spain, of course, you have the uh, collapse of the Socialist Party. They may, they may recover, I'm not sure. The rise of Podemos, although they, they're now in crisis. But now you get, first of all, in Catalonia, the same thing as in Scotland. What happened, the, the movement in Catalonia last autumn was like a revolutionary movement. Huge mass demonstrations, people taking the streets, taking on the police, and so on and so forth. And that's not gone away. But above all, the reason why this is, was occurring in Catalonia, like in Scotland, is, look, we are fed up with the, this gang in Madrid, and we don't see any other option than to get rid of the, the PP government, which has been re-elected several times, than to separate. You can agree or you can disagree, but you must understand the logic. And that, and incidentally, I, I'm after, I have to say, I made a, make a slight concess, uh, confession. Those that know me know that I'm a fairly optimistic person as a rule. But I went to Spain. I know Spain very well. Anna and I participated in the struggle against the Franco dictatorship in the 1970s, and we've seen all kinds of developments since then. But I must confess that when I, I came away from Madrid Christmas time, profoundly disturbed, because there was a reactionary mood in Spain, not in Catalonia, but in Spain. The government whipped up an anti-Catalan mood, they played on the card of Spanish nationalism, poisonous Spanish nationalism. I was quite uh, shocked to see Spanish flags, that's uh, monarchic flags, flying in working class districts. In Madrid, I'd never seen such a thing, ever. In 40 years, I'd never seen such a, th such a thing. I came back a little bit depressed, I must confess. But just the comments said, Jordi said, well, it's superficial. I said, it didn't look very superficial to me. By God, he was right. Within a couple of months, it swept away. The 8th of March. Mass demonstrations throughout Spain. And even before that, mass demonstrations of the, of the pensioners. The same, and in these demonstrations, there were no Spanish flags. There were Republican flags. Anti-monarchy, anti-system, anti-government. That's the, the real mood. And Spain, I've no doubt about it. If you like, the rest of Spain is catching up with Catalonia now. And that can't be a bad thing. That's a colossally important uh, development. I'd like to deal with Spain and other countries in detail, but the, the chairman is going to shoot me down in flames. Just to say that as far as Europe is concerned, again, nothing has been solved. There's colossal debt. Italy just had a general election. I don't know if you noticed that. And uh, the, the, the bourgeois was shocked. Again, the collapse of the centre. This nice man, Mr. Renzi, smashed. He's finished. He's washed up. And there's two populists. I don't like that expression. Two populists. Two populist movements or parties. The Five Star Movement, led by a comedian, Pepe Grillo. You could say, well, Italian politics has always been a little bit of a farce, so one, one comedian more or less doesn't make much difference. At least he's a bit more amusing than Berlusconi, who's also there, you know. The, uh, the Night of the Living Dead. This, uh, and there is the, there's the League. It used to be called the Northern League. Now it's the League which is a right-wing party, but they put forward populist arguments and so on. Between them, they got 50%. And you read the articles in the press, it's full of doom and gloom. And Italy, by the way, is the third largest country in the Euro, Eurozone. And by the way, both these movements are fundamentally opposed to the Euro. That's nice. That's a nice perspective for Europe. Of course, we can add to this mix, this wretched mix, Brexit, but I won't go on that ground because we'll deal with that tomorrow. Suffice it to say, the ancient Greeks had a saying, you know, those whom the gods wish to destroy, they first make them mad. I think Theresa May is slightly unbalanced, you know. You know, a side, by her side, Mr. Trump looks like a model of sanity, you know. I mean, for goodness, they're picking a fight with Russia, for goodness sake, you know. Oh, the royal family is not going to the football match in, uh, in, in Russia. This is, this is serious stuff, you know. Johnson says, Johnson says, this is war. This is war. What are you going to do? We're not going to go to the football match. <laughs> it really is a farce. And the same Indian woman thinks they get, these Tories think they're going to get a deal off Europe. They cannot get a decent deal off you. They can't. Because Merkel can't give them a deal. If she were to do that, it would encourage the breakup of Europe altogether. <clears throat> can't do that. Got to make advantage of the Brits, and they will. So watch this space. Yes, I think I'm being shown, shown the door here. Now, I must say just a couple of words, because 
What I've described here is a, a colossal social ter turmoil and a radicalization. All right, it's confused. It's getting incoherent. It lacks body. It lacks, lack, it lacks a coherent program. But that, that's our job. That's our job. That's why we're building an international. And we're building an organization in Britain to try to provide the necessary clarity to this movement which already exists independently of us. We didn't create this movement. We must inter inter intervene to, to shape it in the, in the proper uh, manner. The same internationally. Now, before I... Uh, go, I must go off the uh, ranch capitalist countries, which is a pity. We've got a lot more to say. World relations, you have the same instability. The same instability. There was a time... When America, first of all, the Americans and the Soviet Union, they ran the, the world. Soviet Union collapsed, so there was just one country, the Americans. They thought they were going to throw their weight around. They did throw their weight around for, for a while. They invaded Iraq. George W. Bush, I think he's seen too many John Wayne films, you know. He invaded Iraq. They destroyed the Iraqi army. What was the effect? Well, look. The first effect, which they didn't, uh, because they foresee nothing, they understand nothing, they're a bit dim. The Yanks are particularly, well, you know, the Brits are more dim still than the Yanks these days. It didn't used to be the case. Uh, they, 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 first, they, they destroyed the Iraqi army, so the Iranians came. The, the Iraqi army was the only counterbalance to the Iranian army in that area. Now the Iranians have, 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 have gone in, said, thank you very much, they come in. And in effect, together with the Russians, they're running the show. In Syria, for example. In Syria, they were trying, th these disgusting people, these hypocrites, the Americans, the British, the French, for the last seven years have been supporting the monsters in Syria. I'm, say, I'm not saying that Assad is not a monster. He is, of course. But these people, if you can imagine, they're even worse. The jihadis who go around murdering, slaughtering, torturing, kidnapping, raping, destroying everything in their path were financed and organized and armed by the American imperialists and, of course, the Saudis, these gangsters who just came to London and the nice British uh, ruling class were licking their ass in effect, for, disgusting, fawning and falling over them for the loot, for the money. That's their principles and their uh, humanity. While well, these gangsters are slaughtering people in, in, in the Yemen. Yes, it's a lamentable picture in the Middle East. But these reactionary forces, Russia stepped in and that was the end of it. You see, Russia doesn't just stop sending the royal family to the uh, football match. They send bombers and guns and rockets and tanks. They mean business. And by God, they've turned things around in Syria now. Assad is sitting pretty. They will not remove Assad now. It doesn't solve anything because the Turks have moved in. It's, it just, it's, it's a colossal mess. So what is, the, what is the beacon of hope? Well, there is a beacon of hope. You know, Galileo... Uh, uh, Galileo on his deathbed, he was forced to recount his opinions about the stars and so on by this marvelous Christian institution, the Spanish Inquisition, showed him the instruments of torture and uh, he changed his mind. But on his deathbed, he said the famous words, e por si muove, and yet it does move, referring to the, the, the rotation of, of, of uh, planets around uh, Jupiter, which destroyed all the old uh, things, and yet it moves. In the Middle East, in spite of all the terrible suffering and uh, black reaction which does, it does exist, the other day there were some leaders of the Iraqi Workers' Communist Party at the center gave us some useful information about that. <clears throat> but, in the, but you see, it's not over until it's over. Iran is the key. We've said this before. Iran and Turkey. Not over in Turkey either, despite Erdogan's uh, monstrous rule. In Iran, despite all this monstrous uh, repressive regime, after, after many years, the rule of the mullahs, the rule of the mullahs, in my opinion, is finished. There have been movements, it's true, in the past, big movements. Uh, but they were mainly movements of students and middle class people. They were important, but ultimately they were defeated. But in the last few months, it's changed. In January, there was an absolute explosion which came from nowhere, took them by surprise, it shocked them. Not students, unemployed youths, poor people, in the very areas which is the heartland of, of the mullahs of, of, uh, of uh, the Islamic uh, Republic. Huge movements. And it, it took everyone by surprise. 
Against what? Against the cost of living because there's a crisis economic, the same capitalist crisis in Iran, aggravated by san sanctions, rising cost of living, unemployment, and so on. These were the main demands, the social, the economic demands, class demands, to, to give them that they would. And what I noticed was this. These demonstrators tore down posters of Khamenei, the supreme leader. This is astonishing. That's a death sentence in Iran. They tore down posters of Khamenei. Not only that, they tore down posters of the Ayatollah Khomeini, who was the chief man of the Islamic uh, reaction in, uh, in Iran. All of that died down. They made some concessions. They arrested a couple of people. They died down. Now it's flared up again, suddenly, without warning, and it's spread to other towns. Students, farmers this time, yes, peasants, and workers. Steel workers are on strike now as well, which is a, which, that's a, a death knell for that system. It's finished. And I'll make the following prediction. Uh, the, 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 the Iranian revolution is on the order of the day. But no doubt about it. This regime is rotten, it's corrupt, it's on its last legs. It's staggering forward, just on the basis of a kind of inertia. It can't last. The mullahs were supposed to be clean. That, that's how they sold themselves. They're clean, not corrupt, not like the Shah and so on. Everybody in Iran knows that there's nobody more corrupt than the mullahs. Everybody knows this. It's a well-known fact. The women are, are, are rebelling against the, the system that, that forces them to do ridiculous uh, things. It can't do this, can't do that, can't do this. It's finished. And therefore, I'll say this. If you ask me what form will the future Iranian revolution take, I can't answer. I don't know precisely what. We don't know what precise form it will take. But I'll tell you one thing. There's one form which it will not take and cannot take. It cannot be an Islamic revolution. It cannot be religious in Qatar because that's finished. That's discredited. It's hated by the people in Iran, particularly the youth and the women. And therefore, a revolution in Iran will transform instantly the entire situation, starting in Iraq and Syria and so on, to be transformed. It requires a movement of the working class to break this uh, nightmare, this uh, stale, stale bit that exists. And so finally, because I've run out of time, to bring, this, to bring the threads together, what conclusions do we draw? This is the most unstable, unpredictable also in many respects, unstable and turbulent period in human history, and also potentially the most revolutionary movement, uh, period in history. Let nobody think or believe the, the opposite. And the main characteristic of this period is what? Sharp and sudden changes in the situation. Everywhere. Expect the unexpected. Many unexpected things have occurred. And people there are with their mouths open, you know. Oh, we weren't expecting this. Oh, we weren't expecting that. Oh, how is this possible? You know, Trotsky once said, the theory, Marxist theory, is the superiority of foresight over astonishment. We must not be astonished by anything, comrades. We must be prepared, prepared for sudden dramatic events in Britain, now, any time. This government can collapse, we'll discuss that tomorrow. There can be a big, big movement to the class. Our task, however, is not to do that we can't uh, influence the general course of events. We must prepare for revolutionary movements. We must build the necessary cadres and develop and recruit, above all recruit and build our small forces until they become a viable element in the equation that's actually able to influence events. That is our task. Upon our success, the success or failure of the world revolution and the British revolution ultimately will depend.